You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. I, I did want to talk about, it, you know, if we had time, I believe you won a pretty cool ass tournament here at with the Elite Seventies, right? This year, yeah, I won the championship, I guess. Yeah, and that's, that was a, a, that's a pretty one. big deal um, because everyone knows about Kerr, and I Caston's been crazy. How to? I remember when I was like fourteen, going down there with tons of grass. I mean, just largemouth, and it's changed a lot since I was 14, 15 years old. And it, I just honestly want to talk about Gaston because I don't think that gives enough praise mm-hmm. like Kerr does. But then also, I want to talk about your win if you want to get get into that. Yeah, you've told me is that that's your one of your top places? Are you like you said? Gaston's, that is by far my favorite lake in the state of Virginia. To really? Fish. I think you told me it sets up. And now Chesden's you know, right? coming up on it because I've only been there once for about five hours, but. Gas and by far a favorite, and yes, it fishes it's so like, much like Anna. Like Anna. Okay, cool. Yeah, talk, like talk about like gas now. Gaston, guys, for you who don't know, it's um, it's the lake that's just below the uh, Lake Kerr on I think it's the Roanoke River system of lakes. I think it goes Kerr, it goes Gaston, and then like, Roanoke Rapids. I think is yeah, the, Roanoke, Rapids, Roanoke is Rapids, is Rapids is the next one down next, below it, and they're completely different. Mm-hmm. And so, totally different. Gaston, where you had your big big tournament win like what what is that like like you said it fishes like anna yeah it fishes just like anna except for now we got spotted bass in it um the thing about the spots are though you're not going to find well now they're starting to get really big you've seen in some winter trails if you like i said i'm a bass geek i follow everything <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh you're starting to see a lot of times like north carolina does a lot of their tournaments on gas because mm-hmm. two-thirds of the lake is in, in north carolina, north carolina. Yeah. um there's guys bringing in five six pound spotted bass out of there now um, which would be the state record for Virginia, but since they're launching out of North Carolina, it yeah, doesn't consider. So that's crazy. Um, but you're starting to see those fish get brought out of Gaston, which I'm not appraising. Oh my God, we need spotted bass in every lake. It actually ruined the lake, in my opinion, for the largemouth fishing. Hmm. Um, what what was the di- did you see a difference in bass behavior or just the size? Oh of yeah, you, you're rarely out? catching a largemouth anywhere. That's crazy. It's it's so hard to get on a largemouth bite on that lake anymore. So you think it's nowadays, it's primarily a spot lake then? Give it five years, it's going to be the next Lake Hartwell. Really? Yep. Wow. That's crazy. And with the size spots that Hartwell has. So the plus is, if you're a Virginia angler, and you probably didn't know this, but we have a blueback lake. We have a spotted bass lake. Oh, by the way, Smith has blueback, Bugs has blueback, and Gaston has blueback. And you you don't hear about this. And you always hear about like, well, if you want to be a professional angler, you got to live in Alabama because that's where you're going to get the whole flavor. And like, that's why I want, again, like not trying to toot the horn there, but this is here for an angler. You don't have to be born in Alabama to be able to have the variety. And and you're living proof of that. You can hit, you can have such a well-rounded pedigree in this area. Well, look at John Cruz and look at Ed Loran from the elites. Them guys are staying consistent as can be. And John's been doing it for, 20 wow. plus years or whatever and stayed consistent his whole career i mean living in virginia you can mm-hmm. do that mm-hmm. good point you know like Cruz does great on st john's river who would think a guy from virginia would do good on yeah. st john's river yeah. it's because he's got the james river to you know yeah. hone those skills in and you know stuff like that mm-hmm. so people don't understand the anglers that come from virginia have the variety we have yeah they only think we know the Potomac River, maybe Kerr, that's it. we got nothing else. Dude, you else. can go to Moon Maw and catch 20 plus pounds of smallmouth in 100 foot of water, and, and people right. don't know about no, that. Yeah, no one, one knows yeah. about that either. But <laughs> now, getting back to Gaston, I'm sorry we went on a tangent about that, but like, so spotted bass, you know, you're from Lake Anna, the Lake Anna area. What did you think about that when you started to get to tangle with spots? Like, that's um, a different creature, isn't it? Oh, it's a different, <laughs> I like spotted bass. They're fun <laughs> to catch, but when you're in a tournament aspect and you remember the Gaston days of going and catching 20 plus pounds a day and that was a normal and now you're lucky if you get 17 you know that's where I'm like eh it might have ruined the lake a little bit now don't get me wrong the 20 pound bags are still there I should have had it one of the days of that tournament but we're not going to talk about the bad day (laughs) yeah (laughs) but no it's it's the spotted bass are becoming something that yeah, the state wants them out of there. They want you to get rid of them and stuff like that um, and not spread them more or less. Uh, but they're getting big mm-hmm. in there. And it, it's getting to the point where you can literally key in on spotted bass and catch 14, 15 pounds on that lake. So there's, t- like you said earlier, the 20-pound sacks of spots, they're coming eventually. They're, oh, they're going to be there. It's it's coming. Now, mm-hmm. for, for anglers that don't know, like, do, do you – do you fish differently when you're going after the spots, especially the Virginia and Maryland anglers that don't have access mm-hmm. to them? Do they fish more like a smallmouth or do they fish more like a largemouth? Smallmouth. Smallmouth? 
Um, certain times of year, different things. Like, um, I did really well years, uh, four years ago on Gaston in a spring tournament. I was catching spotted bass under docks, three and four pound spotted bass under docks. Damn. And my, I weighed in the, I think the second heaviest bag of the tournament, that tournament with just shy of 19. And I had three spotted bass in my bag. Wow. So, <laughs> and the two large mouths were only four pounders, if that tells you. Good Lord. Um, you know, four and a half. So they're getting big in there. And like uh, the late seventies, we did a side pot for biggest spotted bass. Hmm. My Matt and I ended up winning it with the one he caught that weighed three pounds, 10 ounces. So hmm. they're getting really big in there. Um, and that one actually came off a dock. So that shows you where they can be fished just like largemouth. But if you want a big population of them, you got to go like smallmouth certain times of year and just get out there. They get deeper than smallmouth, in my opinion. You can catch spots in 40 to 60 foot of water, like regularly. Hartwell, them guys do it 50, 60 foot like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. wow. And I think this will start tying into to your specific tournament. Is Gaston now that, that largemouth grassy type of fishery that it used to be or with the spots and where we are now how did you approach it when you were going into this tournament with now your experience on Hartwell and the blueback like what was your do you do a generic game plan going into that tournament I did I actually um so Matt and I had talked about it he had found some fish largemouth doing a, a whole different deal up towards the river and I had found down the lake a spotted bass deal so we for got the a morning large mouth time. version and you got a spotted bass version in the boat <laughs> and both of them were different times of the day ah. so mine was a morning deal his was an afternoon deal so we rolled down in the morning to my spotted bass and both days we had a limit 20 minutes eight to ten pounds of, well second day not so much but i think we had four the second day but we had the 310 spotted bass going you know with 12 inch or 14 inches because it's 14 inch limit down there um you know just barely 14 inch keepers but practice i was catching 15 16 17 inch spotted bass down there but we focused on the spots in the morning fished some brush piles mid-morning and then ran and did the afternoon deal up in the rivers and that's how we won that event it ended up day that's one smart. we caught a limit of spots Got all the jitters away, you know, everything's going good. First brush pile we hit, I catch a four. Next brush pile, I catch a six. And those are largemouth. And then we ran up and got rid of literally every spot we had in the bag that day. Wow. Now, day two, we had the big spot and caught a bunch of little ones, did the brush pile deal, did not work out on day two, ran up the river, ended up calling out all our spots except for the big one with largemouth. So in those, in those, I, was that crazy that you caught a largemouth in a um, in a spotted bass area? Because you no. said, mentioned the depth thing. It wasn't like super duper crazy. Like you, you it wasn't like oh crap, there's a largemouth here type of deal. It was oh no, when place. I pulled up on it, I was expecting a largemouth. Okay, to bite. okay, gotcha. It was it was it was either going to be a largemouth or a big spot. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. It, you know, it was just small brush pile. One, it, I like to fish a lot of things that are just big enough for a big one to live in. Gotcha. And okay. so it was one of those deals. It was pull up. Matt Matt actually keyed us into it. He pulled up on that stretch. I actually knew exactly what we were pulling up on because I had a brush pile there that I've known from past, and it worked out that way, that he had found some of the same deal. Like, it happened to set up on the same deal he found up the river. We were just able to do it down the lake in the morning, too. And this is day one. This, this is, like is day, one. day one. We pulled up, caught the spot of bass, rolled over to... It was a dock. I'll be honest. It was a dock. Mm -hmm. I had a brush pile on it, and it was a stretch of docks that I fished religiously, and it just happened to set up on the same pattern that he had found up the river. Mm -hmm. So when we rolled over there, I was like, good, there's a brush pile. I'm going to hit it. Bam, four-pounder. And then you guys, and then how much weight did you have to have, how much weight did you have after day one? 17. You're at, you're back at the hotel where you are. Are you thinking that this is like, we got this, we have a chance to win this thing? Like, what were your thoughts after day one going into day two? We needed 17 again to win. So you were, you were thinking, if we hit 17, we got this thing in the bag. Yeah. When you're in that situation where you feel like you, you got to call your shot, did you want to, when, you, when you're talking, because this is the other thing too, it's a team event. Mm -hmm. So you have two heads now. Like, did you guys, was there some bickering in between the days of what you're going to do? Did you already know, like, this is, we're going to execute such and such plan did you guys call audibles like what was that between day the one six and day pounder two? was an audible really it was we were running up to go do our second plan matt happened to look over to his right hand shoulder like this and said that looks good spun the boat a whole 360 and it happened to be a pocket that i fished in the spring that looks good <laughs> God, and it man. set up the same pattern as what we figured up the river and we pulled in there and i caught the six pounder 
That is crazy. And it was literally like boat went 360. He rolled in there and I made the cast and caught the six. Mm. That just show you too. You know, people don't realize how much decision making goes into fishing. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And it, it sometimes it makes it or breaks it. I mean, it's sometimes a good decision, sometimes not, but and that see, is pretty awesome. And that was day one. The decisions he made, you know, we bounced the ideas off each other. It, nothing, you know, it was no one particular person that made all the decisions. Mm -hmm. But there was something like that one. Like, he was like, that looks good. I was like, let's hit it. And he was like, all right, and spun the boat. We went, you know. And uh, his decision-making day one was flawless. Mm -hmm. Like, he had, yeah. he had his plan in the afternoon. I didn't get to practice with him, so I didn't know what we were going to. We had talked about it, but... Until you actually see it, you don't know what you're going to do, you know? So so then you're, you're talking to him beforehand in the tournament. You're working out your pa your pattern, your, your game plan. You execute day one. Awesome. We got we got around 17. We need 17 to win, have a chance to win this thing. You get back to the hotel. Um, are you guys butting heads? And just and just general stuff. Are you no, guys butting we, heads? Or are you guys already know, like, guys, we're going to execute the exact same plan, or are we going to modify it? No, we, uh, we had the same game plan. We're going to go to the same spot we started on. Which sucked because it happened to be a boat sitting on it right when we got there mm. first thing that morning. But I had a backup plan in case somebody was, and we pulled up there, and that's where he caught the big spot, and we killed, caught three more keepers, something like I that. I think that's big, too, is like when you have multi-day events, because mm. if you're used to club stuff, it's a one day. Mm. You already had, like, we're going to execute this, but if there's something that goes wrong, these are our backups already yeah. in there. So you don't get your wheels spinning out or anything like that. And that's what we did, and... We left. We ran the same game plan. It did not work out whatsoever. So then, I was gonna say a lot yeah. of times it does. A lot of times that day one or day two, you might have a great day one, and then day two flops, or or you had a flop on day one, but day two ends up. Uh, it, you know, it's, it never happens where it's identical, the same. And it's yeah, same yeah. And see, we thought seventeen pounds because we had what was it sixteen ninety eight, and then sixteen forty was second, but then like thirteen pounds was third. So we were like, well, these guys live down here. They're, they're going to crack them. We need to catch them again. So when we did that and then nothing worked, we were like, oh, God. So let's say 10 a.m. on day two, what do you got? And what do you got in the box? Four fish. So are you feeling like decently confident of where you're at with what you have in the box now? Or are you feeling, oh, crap, this is slipping away from us? Oh, no, we had a 310, and I bet you our other three equaled out to the same weight as that 310. <laughs> so we were like, uh-oh. And then about... An hour and a half left to go in the tournament. I looked at him. I said, man, we've gotten small bites off these docks that are out of the wind. Please, let's just go run them. And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So we went and ran them. I ended up catching. We ended up totaling up to, I think, just shy of 11 pounds. 11 like pounds something down. like that on the second day. Um, granted, we should have. Matt, Matt broke off one that we saw tail walk that was three and a half three and a half you know good it would have helped yeah. big time and then i had the same situation as the six pounder wrap me around 10 different dock poles and break me off on day two so we were coming back in with our heads tucked like we just gave this away mm -hmm. we both looked at each other we're like he texted his wife and i texted jesse and i was like we blew this thing we, we didn't win it but that goes to show too why like it's a full tournament and there's, there's something about you got to go to the buzzer you got to go to the end and mm -hmm. you don't stop oh, yeah. you don't quit you know it's up to that last cast uh not knowing too what everybody else is doing that's the thing incredible thing about the fishing too because you're thinking that but it ends up being enough to win but you don't know that obviously you're gonna try to catch as much as you do but you just but you don't stop fishing yeah you never don't ever stop one cast is going to be the fish that you need, the kicker fish, to to get you over the hump. And, and I think I what I love is is the psychological turmoil I like to call it when you're fishing team stuff. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, I when yeah. I fished college stuff, when it was the regional stuff, um, when we we're trying to qualify for the national championship, for the national championship, when you're by yourself, you can be in your own head and either be your worst enemy or like every decision is great. When you have someone else in the boat, mm -hmm. you guys feel that tension. You're like, oh, we're 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 shit in the bed today. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? And then you have that friction. And to me, that's mm -hmm. what's so interesting. When you're in the moment with somebody else in the boat. How do you handle that where it's like, I want to do this. He wants to do that. Like you were able in that situation to make the call. Like, dude, we got to do this. Like, is that hard for you two to like have that friction or find somebody, a teammate to be like, yeah, we click. We know when you should take control of the situation. You should. Um, it, it, for me and him and for like an example, one, we're brothers. Like I, I mm -hmm. love the dude to death and I do anything for him. I go over and hang out with him and his kids and we do cookouts all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, we're literally brothers. And um, I used to boat captain for his oldest son sometimes when their high school did club tournaments and stuff around Anna. And uh, so with me and him, it's it's never been 
any like conflict of like what we need to do because he has his strengths that are different than my strengths. That's huge. So when we're doing something that's his strength, he take go do it. And I just sit on the back. Well, usually I'm right there behind him. If he doesn't try to hook me with a popper, I hope he hears this because <laughs> he'll know what I'm talking about. Um, and <laughs> Rico to the back at Gaston one day. Oh, oh God, it was gosh. fun. Oh. Um, it actually didn't go past the bar, but just ripped my shirt up. Um, but you know, when it's his strengths, go do it. I'm going to sit back here and I'm going to just throw something to you totally different. And usually it's a fairy wand and we'll see what happens. Um, if it's my strength, skipping docks, doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Usually he's like, you take lead and I'll sit back here and do whatever I need to do around you. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've worked things out. And it works out tremendously for us. So, and I like mean, tidal rivers, <laughs> tidal rivers, it's, it's one of those deals. And he, he probably won't be offended at me saying this, but he, has wrist issues from the manual labor and the work he's done his whole life. So he has to cast a certain way to make casts. Mm -hmm. Um, so like with tidal rivers, you know, granted, yeah, a lot of the stuff we're doing is more towards my strength, but for him to be able to make his cast that he needs to do and be successful to help each other out, he takes lead. I cast left-handed all day then. Mm. And that's how we work those things out. And it just knowing what each other's strengths are and what each other can do mm -hmm. is the biggest key in the finding the partner. That's interesting. And having confidence in your partner mm -hmm. when it's coming to team trails. That's hard. It is so hard. Like, Very. I, I mean, comparatively, when you're thinking about making a decision when you're by yourself fishing in open now next year versus when you have a partner in the boat, like that, it, it is a completely different animal. And that's why a lot of partners don't work out either yeah. based on their personality. <laughs> it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just it doesn't, they don't gel. They don't mesh. They don't have the flexibility. Yeah. Um, and so it's not always uh, that you're right. The team, the partner deal, it can be tough. A lot of people go through different partners. And, mm hmm um, that's just kind of a natural thing, but uh, but it seems like you've always been able to to be flexible enough, you know, to use that to strength your advantage with different partners, whoever you're with. And to to basically finish up, you guys ended up winning that tournament. Um, when you're fishing for the spots, were you do you use the same type of baits that that are specifically for 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 largemouth? Um, I didn't know if you want to let your sponsors in know for what baits you used or whatever. But like, do you are you going to use? Let's say if you're jig fishing, are you using a big ass mop jig? and large mouth and spots with that or is it like okay this is a spotted fishery i have to adjust what i throw uh, a lot of times we're adjusting um like when i'm fishing for the spots usually i gotta spin a rod in my hand and okay. i'm throwing a ned's rig um i i drop shot and me personally i throw the finesse sheds from z-man love them not sponsored by z-man so don't you know my dad is but i'm not <laughs> i'm sure i got more z-man stuff in my boat though than him <laughs> um <laughs> z-man if you hear it call me um <laughs> but uh so most time i'm throwing drop shot ned's rig uh shaky head stuff like that uh nico rig neff taught me the nico rig oh, really? uh I, I i'd always heard about it but when i boat captain for neff down at gaston he was throwing that nico rig out there on those spotted bass on that spot and was wearing them out and i was like huh and then he ended up going up to a spot that I usually throw a jig or something on. And he threw the Nico rig and caught a four pounder and a couple other fish. And I was like, wow. interesting. So, mm. and then we talked about this story a week later, I had the state championship. I was a co-angler down there oh, wow. at Gaston. I made the state team off the Nico rig cause of meth. Isn't that amazing? So, so when you said you had fish wrapped, you're fishing spinning stuff when they're wrapped, not. Big oh yeah. No, I'm talking six and eight pound oh, test line. God. Yeah. Oh. Like that six pounder, I had it wrapped around ten poles with eight pound test line. My Matt wanted to cuss me. Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> we, it, it worked out. It ended up getting hung on a cross member, like like I guess it was this way. And you could see the fish's tail right here and he was pinned up right there and I got him on eight pound test line and it's not moving. We're like, Oh god. And I ended up trolling motor up to the dock, stuck my rod in the dock with a spinning rod, and he come out the cross member and she took off under the boat. And was just stripping drag, and finally I got her back around the boat and edited her. I mean, wow. as long as you play them right, and believe it or not, that game of line, I'm not sponsored by game either. I got to make sure I say that, but that game of line is unbelievable. It never had a fray. Mm. How do you um, emotionally, spiritually get to the point where you can, you have, I'm going to skip this thing under there with eight pound test and Jesus takes the wheel. How do you have that kind of, 
like how do you play them like how do you go about that because i know in this area everyone wants to just throw the, the big ass flipping and pitching you're going to skip a jig because you need to have your line but you're right and a lot of times especially these tournaments you need to go lighter but people are so against bringing out the fairy wand but you can make a career brandon polinick you know people like that yeah. doing that like how do you mentally deal with that and then playing the fish if, if you get into that what's the worst thing that's going to happen brace your line mm. you're not dead who cares? Move on. You're doing the right thing. Just keep getting bites. Eventually, it'll go your way. That's how I think about it. It sounds like, too, like you were, you were talking earlier, but like it's kind of like the patience thing, too. Yeah. You're yeah. letting the fish do its thing. You're talking earlier about drag. I, mean, I don't think yeah. those guys use drag enough. Don't try. And a lot of those power fishermen, they're, it's always about horse in it. You can't in that situation. I think, to your point, just kind of letting it play out. Mm -hmm. Take your time and let that thing swim and take your time with it. Let it run. It needs to run. And just let the rod do its thing, let yep. the drag do its thing, and then in time, to your point, and that's where I think people get in trouble too. You try to horse it too much, try mm -hmm. to get it back too quick, and that's when you know trouble's going to set in. As opposed to, and like you said before, not that it's not going to happen; it has happened. But yeah. you've also been able to net a lot of fish or boat a lot of fish. Um, you just got to well. let them so, do their thing. Yeah, it's much right. easier to bring a wore out fish around a dock pole than right. a fish that's trying to run the other way. That's right. So you just got to let them go. So if we may talk about your setup, was that important, your your, your rod and reel setup for this win? Like, did you have to have that dialed in to um, deal with well, these fish? For throwing what I like to throw, the shaky head, you know, stuff like that under docks, I, I throw a TFO shaky head special spinner rod. I am sponsored by TFO. I love their rods. Check them out. I'm serious. They're unbelievable rods. I went from another rod company that a lot of people like to these TFO rods and I was questioning it a little bit and since I've thrown them it's been unbelievable mm -hmm. um, so I was throwing their shaky head special and that rod when you're cranking into them because I crack them with a shaky head don't think 8 pound test you got to lean into them no really? I crack them okay. I just have my drag set right and when you have your drag set right you can crack them as hard as you want to and then just go from there so I cracked, for example, the six pounder I cracked her shaky head that rod it just got the most perfect parabolic bend so with that fish running around all them poles, for example, that parabolic bend's just letting that fish do its mm -hmm. thing. It's keeping good pressure with her. And then the lose reel that I throw, by all means, if the drag just, I just, literally, I just had to do was sit there and hold her. When she wanted to give me some line, I just reel up a little mm -hmm. bit, wait until she's, wait until she was done. Mm -hmm. And the rod, the reel, the line, just got to trust your equipment when you get into doing stuff like that. Are you running a leader setup? Or yes, running I'm running 10-pound braided line to 8-pound uh, gamma. Okay, wow. Yeah, that that is – I don't – I people need to be hearing this because I feel like mm. – especially because we are a title – everyone thinks we're a title play, mm. so big lines and stuff. But how many tournaments – I there have probably been one more on the spinning stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember we talked to Jeremy. Like, Jeremy said, yeah. what do you say? I only own one spinning yeah. rod. Yeah. Oh, I got um, five. <laughs> That's and that's probably what your success and what's going to really help you with like the small some of my biggest bags and wins on Potomac. I've won it on eight pound test, mm -hmm. tidal river, James River. Uh, we were fun fishing last year. We had twenty six pounds, me and my buddy. Mm -hmm. Just we, I got the picture somewhere on my phone. Everything we caught come on a drop shot, eight pound test now around you, cypress trees. Do you like a short leader? Like I mean, like if you wanted to get into it, like tell us about you like that that part of the setup. Do you run a an FG? Do you run like a, a three inch leader? Do you run a ten foot leader? Like how do you like to have it set up for you in a tournament situation? Um, like you talking leader from yeah. braid to the bait, yeah, leader um, length and stuff. So what I do is the sugar have a rod. I could show you on a rod, but what I do is usually you tie your leader, reel the knot up to the tip. And then pull your spool down to the butt of your rod, and that's all the leader you need. Okay. Because when you go to cast, your knot won't be in your reel. Mm. So with your knot being not in the reel, it won't flip on you. It won't do that. I don't tie an FG knot. I tie the um, Alberto mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. Albright maybe. One of those. I can't okay. remember the exact name. Um, but that's what I tie. I don't. The FG takes too much time in my opinion, and this knot in my opinion is the same strength as the FG. Okay. Um, and I've been tying it since i was a little kid when the braid thing first came back around for spinning rods and it's worked ever since um so i tie that i make sure it's the same length of my rod now there's a difference there's times when you're out 50 foot and you're just dropping straight down i'll make it 10 12 15 feet long because i am a firm believer like on a heart well where the water you can see 20 feet down or like up north that longer leader doesn't allow the fish to see your leader not are you running high vis braid or are you running low vis braid? I'm running the moss green moss color green. Okay. power 
what a power pro that's okay. all i throw i don't throw nothing special gotcha i know some guys like to do that high vis yellow or pink stuff, yeah and i mean there's nothing wrong with that i know a lot of guys that do it because they can't see the moss green and uh, when okay. you're throwing like a wacky rixinko you got to watch that line jump and do yeah. stuff where i can see that's a big player but I also like to throw some top waters on spinning rods, like little Ricos and stuff. And I don't want that high vis yellow. Yeah, mm-hmm. you can put a black sharpie on it, do whatever you want. But I don't want that high vis yellow yeah. in front of my pop bar. Yeah, you and know, it gives you the multitask ability yeah. with that yeah. line. Um, so with that tournament, did, were you guys all doing the same? Like, were you guys both basically dragging and doing the exact same thing, or being a partner? Are you trying to have one guy do something a little bit differently in general for, for uh, people that fish team tournaments? Typically, um, with me and him in the, that particular tournament, in the morning we were both doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, I, he was throwing Ned's rig. I was throwing a Ned's rig for them spotted bass. I had a drop shot on the deck. I did catch a couple on that. I had a shaky hit. I caught a couple on that. But for the most part, it was the little Ned's rigs for the spotted bass. Except for I was throwing the four inch. He was throwing the what is it, two point seven five, the smaller one, um, just to see if one or the other would get a bigger bite type deal. Okay. Um, but it, it, spotted bass and smallmouth, everybody throws the Ned's rig. I mean, it's pretty standard all across the country to throw that thing. Them fish can't, you know, like. But um, then when we went to the docks, the brush pile, stuff like that, he was throwing a jig and I was throwing a shaky head. Okay. So we were trying to so see. That's yeah, that's okay. the difference. And then when we were doing the river deal, there was some cranking involved. He would crank, I would swim bait. He would throw the jig on docks up there, I'd still with the shaky head. He would go to a chatter bait, I'd stay with the shaky head. What is your love with the, like, I, I love this. You're talking about like, what? what is your love with the shaky head or that lighter line stuff? Um, like that is some confidence and I just, I love this. It's, I I would have to say growing up my dad. I mean, like my dad likes to throw a shaky head. I grew up throwing a shaky head and I just, it's one of those baits I have confidence in. And when you get to the fall time like that, where one day your fishing could be unbelievable. The next day it could be tough as can, you know, be, you typically can always get bites on a shaky head. Do you feel like the Ned rig is taking, like uh, if you, listen to Bassmaster and all this other stuff. You feel like Ned Rig is now taking over for the shaky head and you got the Nico rig and God knows whether fancy they have that yeah. one with the wine goes through it and it twists and they, stuff. Yeah. Do they all have their niche or do you feel like it's all the same thing? It's just which one you have confidence in? Uh no, I think they all have a different thing. I, I think a lot of the times the Nico rig it depends on rate of fall. Mm-hmm. Um Ned's rig, it's all to do with profile and rate of fall and you know the the stand up you know the way that bait moves um shaky head it's more of a everyone says yeah there is stand up shaky heads out there but i'm a firm believer in even if you're throwing what they consider a stand up shaky head except for david dudley's that has the wire to actually stand it up yeah it's gonna lay flat so it's gonna be more subtle down in like a snake or a worm or whatever you want to consider it slithering through the rocks Unless you're throwing like a worm that actually floats like a Z-Man product or something like yeah. that. Um, so I think they all have their different things and their different, you know, reasons they get bit. And they all have their purposes, in my opinion. Like even the wacky rig, you know, like that's got, you know, you can throw the Nika rig. And I think that's what's happening is a lot of guys are going to that Nika rig because it's falling faster and people are going away from the wacky rig. Just like you said, the Ned's rig and the shaky head and a chatterbait and a spinnerbait. Mm-hmm. you know that's right um so i personally like the shaky head because i'm feeling my uh, personal opinion i think a lot of guys are going to that other stuff and not and they're not seeing the shaky head yeah, as much okay same with the spinnerbait i throw a spinnerbait so much it's not even funny because i think a lot of guys are going to the chatterbait oh yeah I can now if that, you yeah. want to go into chatterbait aspect i don't throw the jackhammer really i think so many guys throw it i still throw the original because they don't see it as much that and is, they don't get yeah. that vibration I, I have jackhammers. I will throw them, but most of the time I don't. I wonder if that'll happen with a Ned Rig. Do you ever think about that? I don't think that? it will because I think it's really? been around for so long. And, and I think we were talking about this the other day, too. I, I, there's times I think we're giving fish too much credit. I think their brain's very small. I think yeah. I think we're, it goes back to confidence and what we're confident mm-hmm. in. Um, I think if you're a fish, you're having to eat to survive um, even more so than us. I mean, we have to eat to survive also. But to them in that environment, I mean, that. The, the, to me, we were talking to like kind of like color. We can get into too, you know, your color, your ten things that are important to the fish mm-hmm. and the lures we're using. Well, you know, color does it matter? Yes, it matters, but at the same time, look at. I mean, working in a bait shop, I'm telling you, everybody comes in. You have ten guys come in, and they have ten different confidence baits, ten different colors, mm-hmm. and they swear by it. Okay, but at the end of the day, I think profile, profile, size point, I think is critical 
personally. Um, and then action of it, uh, speed of it, speed of retrieval, things like that. But I think with the 2.75, I think it it is identical to a medium sized minnow. So yeah, I think when or, that thing hits the ground and it's nose down, it's like if you watch fish, they're going to be nose down feeding, tail up, and they're swimming around. They see that they're going to take it. If, or, you're, if you're jigging it or swimming it, same thing. A dying minnow that turns on its side, it's kind of fluttering around. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's opportunistic for the fish, and I think they're eat, they're going to eat it yeah. every time. I don't think it'll go ever... go to anywhere on the Shenandoah River and lift a rock. Yep, same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The crawfish are all that size. That's right. Could, like, would this be the first? Like, when the seco came out, the big push for that. The whopper plopper, the the, the chatter bait. Is the Nedra going to be the first one that it, it hits and it stays popular and they don't get pressured to it? Because I feel like that's what that's what you're not the only person that said that. Like they're never going to get pressured to it. Because like, well, that's what I thought people were going to say about the whopper plopper or the chatter bait. But I feel like this might. Is it going to be the first bait where it's like, yeah, this is just going to be a fish catcher no matter. I'm going to what. tell you something. I, and people say you can't do this, but you 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 stuck a triangle in front of me earlier. It was a peach piece of pizza. I've <laughs> ate it a thousand, you know, tens of thousands of times. I don't care what you put on. I don't care what color it is. I'm going to eat it every single time. <laughs> Why? Because I'm fat and I like mm. to eat. I want to eat. And so I think with the fish, I think it's the same sort of thing. You said crayfish. Yeah. Crayfish and bait fish, I mean, that's their primary forage. Um, and so, and to, when they, especially when they get big, too. Now, big baits, too. I mean, that goes into that, too. Big baits, um, no doubt, will catch big fish. But it is amazing about the Ned Rig, it'll still catch... Yeah, big fish. You'll catch small fish. You'll catch big fish. The catch 757 we had at Smith Mount Lake came off the 2.75 Ned's Rig. Yes. <laughs> swear by it. All year round too. That's the thing about the Ned Rig. Year around. The season doesn't matter mm -hmm. on that. And nope. I think also, and again, people have told me, well, you can't compare fish to us. But at the same time, I think there's something to it when if we eat a big steak dinner, um, baked potato steak, and we're we're full, right? You you slap that piece down in front of me. I, man, I'm full. I'm not going to eat it. But you give me some M and M's or peanuts or something small. I'm gonna snack all day long mm -hmm. popcorn. I'm gonna snack on that thing. I don't know if it's something mental or not. But I think fish are the same way. They'll eat big. But I think too back to overthinking. I think like you were talking about earlier on live scope. I mean, yeah, the fish are there, yeah. and you're in the right spot. You're dropping it on their nose. Trout the same way. You can drop it right on their nose, literally, and they'll just turn their nose on it. Why is that? But I believe in feeding times too. I think oh, yeah. there's times where they fed up. If they, especially big bass, they fed up big, they're going to go back and slam on the bottom and just sit there. They're not hungry. They're not eating. They're not out. But if you drop that net, if you run that net rig by them or a crayfish, I mean, it's there, opportunistic. They're going to eat it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and again, I might be overthinking it, but I, I do. It, there's no doubt it works. Oh, there's no doubt. No doubt no it doubt. works. And, and a lot of guys still don't throw it. They won't throw it. There's no, they're scared they're going to get hung all the time. Yep. Or the power fishermen, they're just not, they're they're just in the power and they're not willing to downsize and, and finesse it. No, you're right. I, I think it's the hard because I definitely was like more of the Aaron Martins. Like mm -hmm. I am, you you know, I am that guy mm -hmm. that I will weigh everything. I'll check the, the skirt right, thread right. and all that. And I think the hardest part in fishing is to knowing, I feel like that sometimes does work where being that nerdy guy that picks that apart oh, will get you some ice. There's tons. But it's the hardest part of knowing when. Mm -hmm. When do you give it mm -hmm. that extra effort and when do you not? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's in my idea of what a fishing strategy is, it's to know when to completely nerd out because that matters and mm -hmm. to when, like, you're overthinking it, just keep it basic. Mm -hmm. I actually saw um, the Norfolk and Bull Shoals Elite Series. Matt Heron was catching them on a jig. Catching them good. The last day they were at Norfolk. He literally caught one that spit up a crawl. He took the time, got down in the bottom of the boat, changed his whole jig skirt out, made a whole new skirt to match the color of that <sighs> crawl dead, caught a five pounder. Mm. That's the times I think, yes, you're catching them on a bait and you're catching them good, but you notice something's just a little different. You're not getting them bigger bites. Do the switch up. I was watching um, the homage to Aaron Martin and the fact that he learned that they were tagging blackbirds when he was out in Arizona. Yes. And the fact it's like, only him would have that mind that my bait needs to mimic a freaking bird mm -hmm. to make that work. By the way, they do it on Potomac. I, <laughs> I've caught them with birds in their mouth. Is that right? They, and I eat. did not notice it until after that Aaron thing. Really? I thought it was just, oh, mm -hmm. I brought them up through the grass that had some feathers on it. Like no, a black no, bird no. or a duck? No, you know those little black birds that fly yeah, around yeah, the marsh yeah. on Potomac? Right? I catch them all the time on bird imitating stuff punching the grass and throwing black frogs that's why a black frog in my opinion is so good in some of the creeks up there that's crazy oh yeah i've caught them with baby birds hanging out their throat 
That's nuts. So it, I didn't. I never noticed it until the Aaron Martin's but, tournament. And it connects some things. Like, why does this color work? But he was the guy that knew. Like, oh yeah, it's yeah. because they're nesting now. This works. It's like, oh, like that blows my mind. But so to have his mindset, it does pay off sometimes. Mm-hmm. But like we said, sometimes you will go completely in the wrong direction, and it's knowing yep. that to trust those voices in your head. And that begs a question too. Then, like, I mean, I like throwing a mouse, live target mouse. Yeah. You know, hollow body and similar to a frog, but different. Now, but now the question is too: Is that bass sitting down there saying, you know, there's 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 a frog, nah. or there's a mouse, or that's a snake, or that's a bird? I don't think they are. I nah, think, I think they, they're that, reacting. And that's like the whopper plopper. Come on, I mean, that thing when it came out. I mean, it seemed like a kind of a mimic bait, you know, and I can remember being up Lake Holiday mm. and dad's throwing it and this throwing it and nothing, 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 keep throwing it and thinking, well, this thing's a flop. Very first time we ever threw it. And I said, well, let's, you know, keep, we went over to a grass flat and it started getting dark and he caught a four pounder on it. Like never, and that's probably one of our top sellers here. One of the top sellers, a wild whopper popper. I mean, the, but it's got that buzz bait pitch, a little mm-hmm. bit different, but mm-hmm. it's still, you know, what we were talking about color the other day, like guys that think, you know, not to turn you off to all the pretty colors and everything, but if it's, if you're looking up, it's only seeing the bottom profile. It doesn't matter what's painted on top. It can look pretty, but that fish is not seeing that. And it's almost more the, the noise, the vibration to the fish they're needing to eat. It's food. It triggers a response. They're going to yeah. go eat it. So I agree. I mean, I remember, I think, was it Travis from Kingfisher we had on? Mm-hmm. And he talked mm-hmm. about with the cicadas. Yep. That they would only eat, I think it was the, yeah, the, that, well, the females. Well, you bring up a good point, though, too. That yeah. he figured out that when the cicada brood hatch mm-hmm. happened, they got to a point where they would only hit ma- females because of how they sit in the water. They were riding a little bit lower in the water because they might have, like, the egg sac or whatever. Yeah, and it was like, but they wouldn't hit the males. Yeah. Like, that's insane. Like, I feel like you also have to be on the water enough to where you notice it's a bird or there's a color right. difference. You can't be an amateur. And I think that's maybe the issue is the people that try to get nerdy with it mm-hmm. shouldn't approach it that way because you right. don't have the reps yet. Someone like you or Travis, who's a guy who's on the water almost every day, you can almost go down that rabbit hole a little bit more mm-hmm. because you can f- almost feel mm-hmm. what the environment is doing, what the fish are doing. Mm-hmm. If you're Joe Schmo like me who doesn't fish a lot, it's probably not beneficial for me to get in the weeds because I don't have the instinct developed yet to know this. I, I think should percentage, keep it percentage bites too is important. I mean, I yeah. think that's also plays in more. I mean, you can get bit on that, but you're not going to catch as many. You know, it's kind of like throwing the big base. You're not going to get as many bites, but the ones you get are going to be good. They're going to be the right ones. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's where, too, it goes back to decisions. Like you were talking earlier, too, where you get the fish in the box. You're going to catch your five, and you feel comfortable. Now let's go get the right fish. Yeah. You know, now if you happen to stick a five or six during trying to get, you know, then that's not a problem Mm -hmm. either. No, that's your bonus fish of the day. Yeah, that's right. So, it's but, always about bonus fish. That's, that's how you right. win tournaments is you catch that bonus fish there that morning. Go. But it only works, and it's so weird because like when you go that way, that analytical part, it usually only works for that moment. Mm-hmm. Like when I won the ABA, um, uh, the Open, like three or four years ago, I was fishing a spy bait on the Potomac River and a mm. and a non-vibrating lipless bait. Why? Because I was fishing an area where there's six billion people, mm-hmm. and I had to throw something that made different, mm-hmm. it had a different mm-hmm. vibration. I bet you that it will never work unless you had the circumstance of 7 billion boats on that flat. Hmm. But so going in the weeds in that thing might have worked. Might but have, yeah. if you try to do that day in and day out, mm-hmm. I probably get burnt 9% of the time. Mm-hmm. But it's it's weird because you have to – when do you listen to that voice? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the cool thing about fishing is like, okay, I need to go in the weeds now. Mm-hmm. This will help. But it, mm-hmm. it probably won't work every single time. But you have to listen to that voice and know when to tune it out and yeah, when to go with it. definitely be versatile because <laughs> I've heard you talk about how you'll switch it up. And I think that's a key, too, to success is being able not just to be so persistent mm-hmm. and, you know, be able to change it up a little bit, try something a little different. Yeah. Um, and see what results you get. And if you have a result, then why is that? Yeah. You know, and I'm going to try to duplicate that, find that pattern. Oh, and I'll tell anybody that's beginning fishing, mm-hmm. this came from Brock Mosley. I don't know Brock. But I heard this, uh, I forget where I read it or heard it, or my dad might have even told me it. Brock Mosley is so versatile and so good, and the reason he made the elites is because he fished with as many people as he could to learn what to do, what not to do, in wow. so many different styles Very good. of fishing yep. growing up. Mm-hmm. Like, my dad did not want me to fish with him. He wanted me to learn these other, other styles. styles. So anybody beginning to doing it, high school kids, anything like Love that, it. Go fish with everybody. I love it. Because mm-hmm. you think it's too, we're creatures of habit. Same thing. We go yeah. back to the same stuff. And I've heard people too, I heard something last couple times you reiterated and you've talked about it as far as when you go into new body of water, kind of try to just forget what happened last time. 
I think Neil was talking about. That can it. be don't, so hard. <laughs> like, you know what? I had success here and caught fish here. Like, sometimes, you know what? Trying something different, you know, because like you said, you'll go there and it didn't doesn't work. They're not biting. They might be there, but they're not biting. So I have to leave that and go somewhere else mm-hmm. and try something different. Don't be so habitual that you do the same routine over and over again. Be willing to, you know, think outside the box and fish other places. Yeah. Yeah. That that's yeah. yeah. Aim into that. Um, one thing, I guess, before we put a bow on this, um, for, for the spotted bass fishery, what would your top three baits be for, for anyone that wants to go down to, to wants to go down that way and actually fish that lake? What would your top three baits for anyone to go down there and fish spotted bass be any time of year? Any time of year? Yeah. Um, definitely in those week. The 2.75 usually, Personally, they're going to be in 20, 30 foot. I like to throw it on a, what is it, the sixth ounce head? That's not the heaviest. Fifth is the heaviest, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure six. Mm-hmm. I throw it yeah, on the I, next step I, down I, from yeah. the heaviest. Because yeah. um, most time I'm throwing it on six to eight pound test line. Um, if you got other heads that you like to throw that's not Z-Man, you know, throw something like a three sixteenths to a quarter. You know, something heavy enough to get you down there. Mm-hmm. And if the wind blows... You, you can still feel the bait. Um, and spotted bass are aggressive. They like fast fall, falling baits. And then the next one would be most likely a... Um, Let's go with random. Let's see what the sizes are. So it would be like... That one's got a sixth, an eighth. Fifth, yeah. Okay, five sixteenths would be like a heavier one. For Yeah. Sixteenths. Um, yeah. So yeah, something like that. A five mm-hmm. sixteenths, a three eighths. A, there is some that make three eighths out there now, and I don't know how people throw that, but... Mm-hmm. I guess it's for guys that don't want to own a spinning rod. <laughs> um, but then, like, the second bait, I like a little three-inch swim bait. Okay. Perfect. Mm-hmm. You can throw it. I usually throw it on a three sixteenths ounce head on a spinning rod and just slow roll it. As slow as you can get it. You're fishing over 20, 30 foot. The fish are going to come up and eat it. Um, and for any time of year, jerk bait. And work it as fast as you can freaking work it. Hmm. I'm talking make your arm hurt by the end of the day. If you think you're working it fast, work it faster. Are you finishing mm-hmm. the trifecta with three spinning rods on the deck, or are you going to go bait caster with this jerk bait? Um, depends on the size of jerk bait. <laughs> right. When I was at Hartwell, I was throwing it on a spinning rod. <laughs> but no, usually I throw the jerk bait on a bait caster. Okay. And usually it's a seven, five to one reel, so I can work it as fast as I possibly can. Which is good, though, too, because we've talked about that before. When we talked about the beginning angler, don't think that you, a lot of guys, some guys, don't use a bait caster, but you can still throw these just like you've said. You can throw it on a on a spinning reel, you know. So oh, yeah. don't limit yourself either to think that you only have to throw this on a bait caster. Because well, so. when you oh, grow yeah. up, they tell you, "Well, you got to use bait casters yeah, for everything," no. and they beat that over you in your evolution mm-hmm. from a kid. But then you get to the pinnacle, and you're like, "Well, crap! I just forgot this mm-hmm. skill that I grew up with was just you need to throw the you need to throw the fairy ones too." That's right. Oh yeah, and there's a lot of times with a spinning rod with like a jerk bait, like we were just saying is. You can cast it a country mile further, which will get that jerk bait a lot deeper. Mm-hmm. So that's where that can come into play, and that's where it came into play for me at Hartwell was making the long cast, getting it down deeper, and I was only throwing uh, the pointer seventy five, not okay. the one hundred. So you're so, fish, you're not fishing the the big bill stuff. You're really trying no. to keep it above their heads. Yes, mm-hmm. I'm working it fast, like I'm trying to make it look like a top water. Okay, but they just won't come to the surface. Good stuff. Yeah, really good stuff. Travis, listen, man, I, I just can't tell you enough i really appreciate our relationship that we've had over the years Mm -hmm. and you've always from that time you came up and spoke um and filled in um to the times i've every time i've called them called you to you know come up for our frederick county bass meetings if we're getting ready to fish a body of water uh you've come up and you we put the map out you've talked to the kids about where to fish what to fish and things like that you've been an open book um to the time at gaston he came down we needed a boat captain i know you talked before about other people too You, you you know, helped us out um, when you took Jacob out. And, and the night before that gas tournament, I alluded to this earlier when we were talking to Jeremy, um, and we had been struggling down there. Um, and then you, you know, talked to the boys um, the night before that tournament. And then just the things that you had to say were, I think, really profound. And and just that idea of one thing I like about you, too, is you, you mentioned earlier about not to be cocky. Mm-hmm. Um, good athletes. You've been out, you played baseball. You, you've grown up, you played baseball and other sports too, but good athletes, um, great people, they, 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 it's not cockiness, it's confidence. Yeah. You, you yes. have a, a confident uh, demeanor about you, and if, if you want to be good, you've got to have that confidence mm-hmm. factor. 
And uh, but at any rate, you've uh, and we went out and you you know took Jake out and like I said, I think you all finished second that yeah, day. Got he second. finished second. And what was it really cool too? I heard him say about how we were talking earlier too. He has taught these kids so much, um, and and they're listening, they're paying attention, and then they're sometimes they're going out and applying or whatever. But then when he said to one time too about how Jacob taught him something, I thought I kind of was like, what you know. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> so it's uh and he kind of alluded to that earlier so I, I think that's pretty cool too so um but i just want to say i wish wish you luck and thank uh, you and i just want to thank you though for mm -hmm. everything you've done for us here you know jake's bait and tackle and with our youth and and our local you know anglers and things like this appreciate you coming on yeah thank you all for a having lot of me guys because a lot of guys when you start competing like that yeah. they're a closed book they don't want to talk they don't want to share the secrets because you're competing uh, yeah. but you're you've never been that guy you're you're an open book willing to share i'll tell you I, what i'm throwing you don't know the spots i'm fishing that's right <laughs> hey, amen and and before we leave uh where can people find you where can people follow you oh um i have a, fa a fishing page called travis luger fishing on facebook that's about the only thing i'm not big on social media and technology i'm terrible at it so most of the time i post it on that um mm -hmm. I've got so many friends on my actual Facebook. I push people to go to this fishing page because you can follow me on that much easier. Um, so that's that. And then also I want to thank a couple sponsors yes, real quick. Absolutely. TFO Rods, um, Crown Battery. They've done a lot for me, helping me get batteries in the boat constantly every year, brand new. So they're great people for that. Um, and then I want to thank MVP that I just picked up uh, actually yesterday. He's doing a lot for me coming into this season. And then I also want to thank, I got to think of Solar Bat sunglasses. Dude, some of the best sunglasses on the market, I'm telling you. I've learned a lot actually with bed fishing because of these sunglasses. Um, and I'm pretty sure that's it. If I'm missing any, I'm sorry. <laughs> So any sponsors that he missed, they'll be in the episode description that you can find wherever you digest your podcast along with his social media handle. So you can you can follow this guy and help support his career as he starts the Bass Opens in 2022. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, this All podcast episodes drop on Tuesday and fishing videos drop on Thursday. Um, give us a follow. My name is Thomas Aarons with Fishing the DMV. And Jared, for those that don't know either, that April James tournament, if you go on Bassmaster, mm -hmm. most people know this, but some that don't go on the Bassmaster site and they can, they'll do the live, live weigh-ins. Yep. And when you come across, you can learn a lot from that too. Yeah, or absolutely. come to Osborne Landing and watch oh, in person right there. That is actually a good point too. It's close enough to uh, and if you, in person. And people that make day three, the weigh-ins will be at Bass Pro Shop, so you can shop and watch a weigh-ins. That, is, that awesome. is a good deal. That, that is a good deal. <laughs> no, that's cool. That's great. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Guys, thanks. Yeah, thanks thank you all. You're welcome. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.